Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this wonderful webinar we're about to have. Uh, as those of you who are already signed on, you can see that we're populating uh, the webinar. I want to wait a minute or two so that we can uh, make sure that everybody who joins, uh, let's say, let's put it this way, everyone who's in a timely fashion has joined us gets to uh, uh, launch uh, the webinar and then we'll begin. So uh, be patient if you would for a minute or two and uh, we'll wait for uh, the uh, webinar to populate. All right, well, it looks like we're, oh, there, a few more people are joining in, I see. So, all right. I'm going to wait until my clock says uh, 4.05 and then we'll begin. My clock, by the way, says 4.04 .04 right now, so. <laughs> All right, we'll begin. It is really my pleasure to welcome all of you who've joined this webinar uh, entitled Thou Shalt Not Stand Idly By. And this webinar features our special guests, uh, the author of a brand new book with that same title, Dr. Georgette Bennett and our other special guest, uh, Ms. Judy Collins, the Grammy winning recording artist and the American singer and songwriter who will be in conversation with Dr. Bennett. Uh, I will be introducing both guests uh, in, in a more elaborate way in just a moment. Uh, for those of you who are first joining a webinar sponsored by the American Jewish Archives, I am Gary Zola, and I am the executive director of this wonderful institution, the Jacob Rader Marcus Center of the American Jewish Archives. I also am a member of the faculty of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, and it is my very special pleasure to welcome all of you this afternoon to this webinar. I want to extend a very special welcome to all of you who may be here for the first time. Let me say a word about the American Jewish Archives. The archives are located on the historic Cincinnati campus of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. And the archives, the AJA was founded in 1947, 75 years ago, by the distinguished historian and pioneering scholar of American Jewish history, Dr. Jacob Rader Marcus, now named in his memory. So over the past 75 years, the AJA has become the world's largest freestanding research center dedicated to the, solely to the study of the American Jewish experience. Now, before I introduce our esteemed, distinguished guests this afternoon, let me just say a word or two about technical matters. On your screen, you will be seeing only the panel of speakers. I presume most of you are familiar with this now instead of seeing everybody. And you will see that at the bottom of your screen, we have turned on the chat feature. And we do hope that during the course of the webinar, you'll feel free to go to the chat feature and put any questions that you have into the chat. We will be harvesting those questions. And at the last part of our webinar, we'll try, Dr. Bennett and Judy Collins will try to respond to as many of those questions as we can possibly fit in. 
Then at the conclusion of the webinar, there'll be a few brief remarks, important announcements. So please don't jump off prematurely. Finally, tomorrow you'll be receiving a follow-up mailing so that you can remain in touch with the AJA and receive notification of our upcoming virtual educational programs dealing with some aspect of the American Jewish experience. A recording of this afternoon's webinar will become available tomorrow on the AJA's website and also on APCJIR's special online learning website. And I will mention this again at the end. So now, without any further delay, let's begin. Dr. Georgette Bennett has enjoyed a remarkable career that has included leadership roles in financial services, the financial services field, in banking, in government relations, in public broadcasting. She is a Renaissance woman, and she has served on the faculties of the City University of New York and also on, at NYU. And she is an author who has been uh, a guest on a host of national news programs. In fact, the AJA, some of you may recall, was honored to have Dr. Georgette Bennett as a featured speaker on one of its webinars, a program back in February of 2021. Now, on top of all of this that I've already said, Dr. Bennett founded in 1992, the Tannenbaum Center for Interreligious Understanding. That is a secular nonprofit organization that works to promote mutual respect and understanding, and also to fight religious prejudices in workplaces, schools, healthcare settings, and in conflict zones. The center is named in memory and in honor of Dr. Bennett's first husband, her late husband, Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum, a distinguished leader in Jewish, in communal relations, a man who has been properly dubbed the father of modern interfaith religious dialogue. The American Jewish Archives is very proud to possess the Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum collection. And we are very deeply honored and greatly appreciative of the fact that Dr. Bennett and her husband, Dr. <laughs> Leonard Polonsky, have enabled the AJA to digitize the entirety of the Mark Tannenbaum collection, which by the way, consists of nearly 80,000 discrete items so that the rabbi's extraordinary career can now be studied freely by scholars and researchers around the world. Now this afternoon, we'll have the benefit of hearing Dr. Bennett speak about an important Topic, a topic she introduces with the terminology humanitarian diplomacy. And it has to do with her new book, Thou Shalt Not Stand Idly By. The book documents the remarkable efforts that Dr. Bennett has invested in addressing the painful, inhumane refugee crisis that has gripped Syria for at least the past decade and more. It's though the book is not merely the story about Syrian refugees. It is the story about America, about Israel, about Jordan, and about the power and efficacy of interfaith collaboration. So without any further ado, I want to turn the floor over to my friend and my colleague, Dr. Georgette Bennett. Thank you so much, Gary. That was a very generous introduction and now I just need to live up to it. Um, <laughs> it's wonderful to be back at AJA, albeit virtually because you do such extraordinary work here that I am very honored that you would have provided this platform. 
And I'm especially honored to be here with my dear friend, um, Judy Collins, who is, if you know her music, let me tell you, she is absolutely what her music conveys. She is a caring, warm, absolutely authentic human being. And um, I adore her. So I'm very happy to be here with our Judy Blue Eyes. Thank you, thank you. So the title of today's program is American Jewelry and the Refugee Crisis. And I'd like to change that a bit to American Jewelry and the Displacement Crisis. That's because there are more than 100 million displaced persons in the world, and only about a third of those are refugees and asylum seekers. The rest are displaced within their own countries. But you know what? That's a technicality. The net effect is the same. 100 million people who have fled or been driven from their homes. 100 million people in desperate need of help. 100 million people who are likely to remain in limbo for anywhere from 10 to 27 years. And that number includes an increase of nearly 11 million people just since last year. And that's mostly because of the war in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easy for the Jewish community mm -hmm. to respond to displaced Ukrainians. But I'm going to focus on a group of displaced people who are more complicated for Jews. It's, it's a group that's largely fallen out of the headlines and largely been forgotten. And as Gary said, it's displaced Syrians. And the silence of the world has been deafening. The conflict in Syria is now in its 12th year. 13 and a half million Syrians are displaced and that's more than half of Syria's population. Nearly 7 million of those are refugees and they're being hosted in 128 countries but most of them are in neighboring countries, Lebanon, Iraq, Turkey, that can least afford to take care of them. And these are just the, ref the, the registered refugees. We have no idea how many thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of Syrian refugees are living below the radar. So why should Jews care? After all, isn't Syria our enemy? Well, we should care because it's at the core of Jewish values to step up in the face of suffering. Leviticus 19.16 tells us what Gary read to you. Thou shalt not stand idly by while the blood of your neighbor cries out from the earth. Our sacred scriptures make no fewer than 40 references to caring for the stranger. There's only one reference to loving your neighbor, and that's because it's easy to love someone who's like ourselves. Judaism's great contribution to civilization is the notion that all human beings are made in the sacred image of God and are therefore deserving of dignity and respect. And that applies to the displaced. All of the great religions include the imperative to provide refuge, but it probably came up first in Judaism. And finally, the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was not homosexuality as it was later interpreted but in hospitality. So let me tell you a story of this Jew's encounter with Syria. I'll open in the form of a question. So what happens when a Syrian refugee an Israeli aid worker and an American Jew walk into a room? <laughs> this, is, this is not the start of a really bad joke. It's what actually happened to me. Starting in 2015, I, the American Jew, found myself holding secret meetings with a small group of Syrian and Israeli civilians in various Israeli capitals. Behind closed doors, we were trying to figure out how to aid the Syrian people who were enduring the worst humanitarian crisis since the Holocaust. So how did we end up at that table together? After all, Syrians and Israelis are sworn enemies who've technically been in a state of war since 1948. Well, we were looking for a way in, both literally and figuratively. And you know what? We found it. We figured out a way to get aid to war victims in Syria via Israel. And in doing so, 
I applied a process that I've used in many different contexts, and it consists of three steps. And I hope they'll be useful to any of you who want to do some good in the face of any of the overwhelming crises that we're facing today. So what are my three steps? Find an entry point, identify a gap, and fill it with something doable. So let me run you through it. When I read a report about the Syrian war, it hit me hard and felt very personal. I was stunned by the scale of the misery, which echoed my own family's suffering in the Holocaust. My parents survived concentration camps in Poland and Hungary. And after the war, we had to flee and we came to the US as stateless refugees. When I saw the destruction of Aleppo, I was reminded of Budapest, the bombed out city of my birth. And when I read about starvation by siege in Syria, I couldn't help but remember the pregnancy that my mother lost, lugging home a sack of rotten potatoes when there was nothing else to eat. And when I saw the emaciated and disfigured corpses of Syrians tortured in Damascus prisons, I also saw the walking skeletons of Auschwitz, Mauthausen, and Bergen-Belsen, where so many of my own family members literally went up in smoke. And when I saw Syrian refugees flooding across borders, I was reminded of my own displacement as a refugee child. So what is, as one person, what do you do next in order to not stand idly by? When you're confronted with something you know you need to change, you have to find an entry point. And for me, that was mobilizing a response from the Jewish community. And soon after scaling that up to the leading interreligious response in the US focused exclusively on Syria. It's called the Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees, and it now has more than 100 partner organizations. But let me go back to the Jews. To this day, Jewish funders are the biggest supporters of the work I'm about to describe. But that hasn't been the case everywhere. Hyas, for example, the Jewish Refugee Resettlement Agency found resistance. Jews were telling them, why should we import more anti-Semites at a time when Jews are under rising threat? And at a time of escalating anti-Semitism, that's a completely understandable fear. After all, Syrians are indoctrinated from a young age to view Israelis as killers and Jews as the devil for supporting Israel. <clears throat> But I saw an opportunity to build bridges between enemies while also saving lives. And as Gary mentioned, it's called humanitarian diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And that's where I found the gap that I could fill. It was very hard to get aid into Southwest Syria because it was surrounded by regime forces and the regime doesn't allow humanitarian aid to get into any area it doesn't control. Israel shares a border with that part of Syria. And guess what? It's easy to get aid into that part of Syria from the Israeli side of the Golan Heights. And that gave me a doable thing that would allow us to save Syrian lives. So we just needed the how. And that's why my colleagues and I ended up in those clandestine meetings all over Europe. We were making the case that Israel should be used as a staging area for the outbound delivery of international humanitarian aid into Syria. We lobbied the European Parliament, UK Parliament, Canadian Parliament. We banged on doors in Congress. We met with every level of government in Israel. And we got nowhere, but then it happened. In September 2016, the Israeli government launched Operation Good Neighbor. It was now official government policy to open the border and facilitate aid from other countries into Southwest Syria. Israel waived all custom fees and commissions on aid passing through the country, and they issued visas for Syrians to coordinate the aid. Now imagine, imagine Syrians coming into Israel. 
So starting late in 2016, huge cargo containers, many bearing goods from Syrian organizations, were unloaded in Israeli ports by Israeli soldiers and sent over the Golan Heights. And from there, our partners on the ground in Syria picked up and distributed the aid to an area with a population of 1.3 million people. We delivered $100 million worth of aid, $120 million worth of aid to the Southwest, supported three medical facilities and a bakery that produced 15,000 pitas a day. Israel provided water, fuel, electricity, and we shipped medical equipment, ambulances, supplies, food, pills, sanitary packages, whatever else was needed. By working through local councils, we helped stabilize an entire area. And for two years, this was the only part of Syria that was working. Then because of an incursion by the regime and its allies, the area was taken over and destroyed. But that didn't stop us. We expanded our deliveries to other hard to reach parts of Syria. In total, we've delivered more than $260 million in aid most of it inside Syria. It wasn't easy, it wasn't hiccup free, but through unlikely partnerships, we've helped nearly 3 million Syrian war victims and still counting. And we're still building those bridges between sworn enemies in order to plant the seeds for future stability in the region. The Israelis were very reluctant to go public with the Syrian-Israeli partnerships that we nurtured. Mm -hmm. That's because they knew that this would put a target on the backs of their Syrian colleagues. But Hassan Aboud, one of my closest Syrian partners, saw it differently. Hassan is a potential moderate future president of Syria and a multi-billionaire entrepreneur who owns a vast media empire. So he took things into his own hands. And in a historic first, his Orient TV ran a 45 minute piece featuring a Syrian refugee in the US, a Syrian doctor who was a refugee in Dubai and a Syrian reporter in Southwest Syria to reveal their humanitarian partnership with Israel. Al Jazeera picked up that story and attacked the three Syrians as traitors. But when the network posted the story on its Facebook page, the overwhelming majority of responses bashed Al Jazeera for bashing the Syrians for working with Israel. I'll give you a, a sampling of the posts from Syrian viewers to show you their contempt for the hypocrisy of the critics. One post said, we're happy with Israeli aid. At least Israel makes real raids on the regime from time to time. Another post, so now helping Syrians and saving their lives is a crime, especially after our Arab countries closed their borders to our wounded. A third, where's the problem? Why don't you come and give us aid instead of selling us dreams and illusions at our expense? Now, Hassan points out that Syria has no hard history with Israel. Assad killed 20,000 Syrians in just one month, and that number by, by now is 500,000. This dwarfs the 5,000 deaths at the hands of Israelis during all the wars that Syria initiated since 1948. Hassan's conviction is that peace between Israelis and Syrians will come not through governments, but from the bottom up through civil society groups and businesses. Mm -hmm. He has a vision of Israeli companies working with Syrian entrepreneurs to rebuild Syria. The humanitarian partnerships between Syrians and Israelis are the one glimmer of hope in a horrific tragedy. If these sworn enemies can rise above politics, mutual suspicion and hate to entrust each other with their lives, there's hope for all the conflicts in which we dehumanize and demonize each other. Early on in my voyage, I met with Syrian organizations in Washington. Their leaders said words that I thought I would never hear. Thank God for Israel, thank God for the Jews. Now mm -hmm. that's something on which to build. And that's my answer to all of those 
who fear reaching out to enemies and turning them into partners. Thank you so much, Georgette, for such a, uh, a really a masterful uh, summary of the story you tell in the book. I uh, told Georgette, to those of you who are listening, I told Georgette in advance of the webinar that I, I read the book over the last three days from uh, cover to cover. It's a very readable book, but I can tell you friends that what Georgette left out, the Georgette left out, uh, although she mentioned it very briefly in passing, uh, were the obstacles uh, mm -hmm. that uh, peppered this path all along the way. And uh, that's sort of the, the uh, as, uh, as Georgette just said, the finding the pathway is, is sort of part of the intrigue of the book. Uh, and, um, but, but I, I was astonished really and, uh, and, and amazed and, and, and very impressed that you, you really were able to tell that story in such a compelling way uh, to summarize what you've written. So uh, we want to have a little dialogue on this topic because it, as Georgette pointed out uh, in her remarks, uh, the reason the American Jewish Archives wanted to focus on this is because uh, it, it is known that uh, if one added up all of the philanthropic work of the American Jewish community, uh, not only for Jewish causes, but for uh, a, a whole variety of causes to which the Jewish community in, in America contribute, it's been estimated that it's a it's it's uh, a a sum that is generated every year of over uh, two billion dollars, which has been uh, uh, referred to as one of the greatest philanthropic feats uh, in modern uh, civilization. Uh, and 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 uh, we want to talk more about that, and and we also want to uh, uh, hear your comments. So let me now introduce our very special guest who um, I would love to say, friends, that um, uh, Judy Collins is my own personal friend and I was able to call her up and encourage her to be a part of this wonderful webinar. But the truth is that we owe that uh, uh, favor to Georgette, uh, who is good friends with Judy. And uh, I, I, I would say this, if ever there was a person who needs no introduction, to borrow that cliche, it's Judy Collins. Her extraordinary musical repertoire has been, as we were discussing before we began, the lyrical backdrop for most of us who are on this webinar, as it has been literally for millions and millions of fans and admirers around the world. Now I could easily, as anybody could, I could easily exhaust the rest of the time we have together if I were to try to list Judy's achievements and accomplishments over a career that spans more than seven decades. It's true she is best known as the Grammy award-winning recording artist with a discography consisting of 36 studio albums, nine live albums, numerous compilation albums, four holiday albums, and 21 singles. <laughs> I was telling Judy before we began that I can recall as a child at camp listening to Turn, Turn, Turn from her voice. All of us know both sides now. More recently, at least for me, Send in the Clowns by Stephen Sondheim. These are just my personal favorites. I'm sure that all of you listening could go on and on. But you may not know that she's a, an author who's published a number of important books. She's a distinguished documentary film director 
who was nominated for a, an Academy Award in the uh, category of documentary film. And related to our seminar today, our, our webinar, a long, long time social activist. Judy's commitment to social justice, to feminism, her activities for landmine removal, her commitment to solving the problems of global hunger, and many, many other important causes is well documented in the literature. Now, after a concert that was given a few years ago, a reviewer wrote the following. This is just a few years ago. Judy Collins' voice is one that should give younger singers either a bad case of envy or a goal to set for themselves. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Judy, we're very honored to have you with us today. And I know you and Georgette are gonna converse a little about this topic, but let me begin by asking you to respond and react to this, uh, to this topic. And uh, why is this so important to you? And why are you uh, personally interested in this? Uh, in, in, and especially in what Georgette has written and, 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 uh, and, and her, all of the work that she's done recently. Thanks, Gary. Thank you so much for having me join you and uh, Georgette. I must say, first of all, I want to thank Georgette for covering the territory that is explored in Thou Shalt Not Stand Idly By. This is an incredible book. I know you have it. I know you'll get it and read it. But I want to also say, Georgette, it's a marvelous book. It's a story of your own personal struggles, your family struggles. And, and it's, it touches me to the heart because so much of what you say is an opportunity for us to look at what you suggested is to find an entry point as to be helpful. You know, we always say, well, what can I do? And that's how I was raised too, in a, in a uh, situation in which my, my uh, family was very activist. They were very, um, my father very interested in helping and being part of the solution and also act being out there talking about and doing something about what's going on in the world. Um, you know, I have to say, I want to respond to your talk with a little quote from your book, because part of what's so extraordinary about this book, yes, it tells the story of a woman who had the courage to figure something out that was different and that would help in a way which brought people together rather than dividing them. And of course, the the unique situation of the Syrians being being uh, being helped, of course, by Israel is remarkable in itself. But I want to read you from page sixty-four, just a few lines. A forthcoming, unlikely partnership, which you mention, of course, in your talk, forming it March twenty fifteen. 300 people are crammed into a large conference room. They sit on windowsills and any other nook where they can find a space in which to squeeze. The attendees are Israelis on the campus of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And they're here to hear the lecture by a Syrian refugee, the first Syrian most of them have ever seen. The Syrian is risking his life by addressing this audience. He forbids any filming his face be, being recognized because being in Israel, he has put a target on his back. The Syrian Shadi Martini, Sunni Muslim and a Zion of a prominent and wealthy Syrian family. A former hospital administrator in Aleppo, he was found to flee, forced to flee after his network for aiding injured civilians was discovered. But now, 2014, three years into the Syrian uprising, he's in Jerusalem to promote the unlikely humanitarian partnership in which he has been engaged with Israelis. I mean, already in this moment, in this book, you bring this all to life. You make it something we can touch and feel emotional about and want to be part of. And how did you, 
how in the world, I know you've had a fascinating life. You've had a life filled with danger. You've had a life filled with success. You've even been a criminologist, which makes me one, makes you, in addition to all your gifts, one of my most interesting friends of all. And so I'd like to know from where you carried this to where you intend to go today. Well, Judy, um, thank you. You managed to very cleverly turn this back to me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Judy, you met Shadi. Uh, Judy, um, I think just three weeks ago or so, actually was very kind to um, help us do a fundraiser for the benefit of the Multi-Faith Alliance and, and the Syrian um, that she just read to you about Shadi is now the executive director of the Multi-Faith Alliance. Yes, I've met him, he's a doll. <laughs> <laughs> so where do I intend to go with this? Well, we are actually expanding our operations. We now have an office in Raqqa. We, um, have a medical facility. Raqqa, by the way, is the, is the former ISIS stronghold. So I think there's great symbolic value in this. And uh, we also run a primary medical facility, which just in the past year has seen about 40,000 patients. We plan to expand the number of medical facilities. We are hoping to move from emergency help to transitional help. And what that means is, here's an example. We, we set up a number of tent cities in Northern Syria with our partner Orient for Human Relief. And we set these up at a time when so many Syrians were fleeing the South and they were sleeping, sleeping rough. They're just literally sleeping on the ground. They had no shelter at all. So we put up 10 cities. We would like to put up prefab housing for them that actually has bathrooms and that has kitchen facilities. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we want to do to move from emergency care to, um, to transitional care and then to self-sufficiency. One of the things that we started doing, which is only mentioned in the book briefly because we hadn't yet implemented it, but an Israeli company has created a system that takes moisture out of the air and turns it into clean water. That's extraordinarily important um, in parts of Syria that are very dry and have terrible water shortages. We are in the process of placing four of these now because we've got funding for four of them, but we very much like to get 10 of them in place mm. uh, by the end of the year. And each one of these takes care of 800 people. Mm. So that's what we want to do on the humanitarian side. But there's another part of our mission which has to do with advocacy for increased refugee admissions. We had to back burner that during the Trump years because there was such a hostility to refugees and so much of the refugee infrastructure was completely dismantled. So we have uh, resumed our activism in Washington and have been involved in, in a lot of advocacy. It's very important to realize that policy has been driven as it's in the US, but we're seeing it all over Western Europe, unfortunately, with this drift to the right and this toxic rhetoric about refugees and asylum mm -hmm. seekers. So policy is being driven by misinformation, disinformation, and fear. And each of those fears can be easily debunked. Yeah. 
But one of the fears is the fear of bringing in terrorists. And what we don't realize is by leaving these people in limbo for so long, you're making them vulnerable to radicalization. Mm -hmm. So if we don't rescue them, or if we don't make life better with them in place where they are, we are in fact creating the very conditions that we fear the most. Absolutely, I, I understand that. I'm thinking about, of course, our, the terrible situation that happened when we decided that certain countries couldn't come in here. And uh, I think it was in, there were seven countries named. And uh, I, at that time, around 2016, I was watching television one day and I, I heard a woman talking about her situation and I quickly wrote down what became a song called Dreamers. And of course, it's about DACA. It's about the problem. It's about what happens around the world. And it goes like this. My daughter is a dreamer. My name, it is Maria. She's afraid. Uh, she fears that I will be have to be turned away. In other words, the mother is thinking about her daughter. And it it touched me so much The, the about the whole situation. And actually, uh, one of my friends who was in Congress at that point said that she played the song for all the incoming uh, people in the Congress in uh, 2018, in 2016. And, you know, this is, this is a, a problem that that affects the world. How does the Syrian refugee and the Syrian help, uh, uh, help structure um, compared to what's going on in Ukraine? Is there any overlap? Is there any kind of help that's going? Is the refugee situation out of Ukraine similar to what's happening in, in the Syrian refugee um, problem? The similarity is in the cause of the Ukrainian refugee crisis. Up until the war in Ukraine started, Syrians were the largest percentage of refugees in the world. It was the largest displacement crisis in the world. Ukraine has now exceeded that, but there are some very important differences. Ukrainians are being welcomed with open arms and easy to understand. They're European, they're white, they're Christian. The Syrians come from a part of the world that uh, we don't welcome with open arms mm -hmm. and 10% and of them are Christian, but 80% of them are Sunni Muslims. Oh my. So Islamophobia is a component of this, but what we need to understand is that S Syria was the dress rehearsal for what Russia is doing in uh, Ukraine, uh, uh, because uh. everything that's going on in Ukraine is what Russia has done and continues to do in Syria. The same kind of scorched earth, earth policy, the same kind of disregard of civilian lives. And if Russia had been stopped in Syria, I, uh, I dare say that Ukraine would not be happening. You know, let me jump in. Let me jump in just for a second, if I, if, pardon me. I, you taught me something in the book, uh, Georgette, I thought you and Judy might want to comment on it related to this very question, because I, I would think that everybody on the webinar today immediately would think of the same question that Judy just posed, which is, uh, you know, uh, look, we've got, the, this is all happening again in the Ukraine. Now you made another point that I think is important. I'd love to hear your thoughts. You pointed out that, um, uh, another, you didn't mention Ukraine, but this is exactly what you were driving at. You you point out that mostly uh, the the problem is that these refugees cannot go back home. In other words, in Syria, whereas it, we've even seen on TV, Ukrainians are wanting to go back to their homes, even if they're still in war torn <laughs> conditions. Whereas uh, the situation in many other places uh, that you've mentioned in your book and certainly in Syria is, it, 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 it's not as if they want to go home mm. because of the conditions, political and social and so forth. 
Uh, do you want to comment on that, Georgette? Well, they do want to go home. Almost all refugees want to go home. They're, they're not fleeing their countries because they want to leave. They're fleeing because they have to leave. Well, well, how did you put it? You said you 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 made it. You made the point. I thought in in your book that it was, it it, it was in other words, there was no place for them to go. Well, that's right because um, so, so much of Syria has been completely destroyed. But it's not only that. There's another element which does not exist in Ukraine, which is that refugees returning to Syria are considered by the regime many of those refugees to be enemies of the people. They're considered to be traitors. Mm -hmm. And the regime also uses a law called Law 10 to disenfranchise them if they try to return home. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are onerous requirements of, to provide documentary proof of your ownership of your home. Mm -hmm. And if you have fled on the spur of the moment and you fled with nothing, you don't have that. So yeah. in many cases, you can't even prove that your home is your home. And I think these are really important points, uh, Georgette, because I do think that on one level, people might tend to compare, uh, you know, we, we all heard on the news about the, the, the dimensions of the refugee problem in, in the Ukraine. And uh, I think the points that you're making now are really important to bear in mind that, that even if, Yes, it's a refugee problem and it's a serious problem and it, it was a gargantuan uh, wave. On the other hand, there are important differences, which is why this is a lingering problem in Syria. Right. That, that, right. That, that, that's, I think, what you're saying. Right. Yes, uh, but let's not forget that there are as many internally displaced Syrians as there are refugees. Yeah. That's important. Judy, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, uh, uh, where, where do you, you know, uh, Georgette in her book speaks, and she mentioned this in her talk, speaks about the fact that, and friends, if you read the book, uh, Georgette really goes into this in, in, in detail about her own uh, early life oh, uh, wow. in Europe and, uh, and uh, yeah. uh, seeing the, the effects of being displaced and the cruelties, uh, e. she was a small child, but uh, you know, it's very much in, implanted in her uh, psyche and this is a big part of who she is. So Judy, tell us, uh, you have been famous uh, from the 60s uh, in being involved in social justice causes and so forth. Uh, where would you say that comes from in your life? Uh, you mentioned your dad, but uh, uh, you know, and, and, and this has continued on for a whole variety of causes that you've given your time and your energy and so forth. Uh, uh, how would you, how would you uh, uh, as you think about, uh, you know, the, the formative years and, and what has shaped you into the person you are, where, what, what would you say about that? My father was extraordinary in his challenging what was going on. He, he was blind from the age of four. He decided that he was going to get around uh, on his own and make a life that was productive and that he was always up to uh, fight for the right. And he taught us that at the dinner table. That's where I learned that. That's where by the time I got into my own career, I was, I was streamlined to be an activist in the folk movement. I spent a lot of time uh, marching and singing and working against the war in Vietnam. I was, uh, Madeleine Albright took my took me by the hand in 1994 and said, I'd like you to become a UNICEF uh, representative, during which I spent time in uh, the former Yugoslavia working on the landmine issues. I have, I have fought, of course, for women's rights. Um, I just said a few words for the anniversary of Ms. Magazine, which which of course is one of the fundamental um, access points to the information that we need about women's rights and, and the rights over our body. I have always been uh, involved in trying to help, but I think with, with, uh, with this, this revelation that, that uh, Georgette brings to all of us, 
about finding the starting point. And that's so interesting that you find the point where you can say something, you can do something, you can take action. I mean, I, I, I found myself uh, in, the, in the 60s, I found myself at the, um, the beginning of the Yippies because I went to the, to the press conference where they were announced and I sang, where have all the flowers gone? And eventually I sang that at their trial and actually had my mouth shut by, by uh, Judge Hoffman. But because of always the access points will reveal themselves. And I believe that's true for all of us. It's in a way, it's like a, I hate to use a, uh, an artistic reference, but it's like a song coming into your life that reveals to you things you didn't know, information you didn't have. And so when Georgette was talking about her, her initial understanding about what, what's going on in, in Syria. She said that she got the, uh, she got the, um, the information about it originally and kept it on her desk. She says, in the beginning, my road, my road from Budapest to Syria, the report was dated January, 2013. It sat on my desk for five months, sinking deeper and deeper into a growing pile of papers. Being a typical overextended New Yorker, I didn't get around to opening it until May, but when I finally cracked it open, it changed my life. And that's the kind of thing that we hope can happen throughout our lives. You know, I remember being, I have always been, been incredibly um, wanting to know more and more always about Israel. I thought I was a great, a student of history, and I went to Israel a number of times, starting in, seven, in the 70s. Teddy Kolick invited me to come and sing at King David's pool in, uh, in the 70s. And so I've had many experiences with this conflict of uh, misunderstanding one of the other. And I more and more believe that the kinds of things that are being done in, in uh, Georgette's foundation are, are, are in a way, they're not just about Syria. They're about our own interior understanding of the other. As she said, you know, in, in the Jewish history, this is the most important point. It's the other, we embrace the other and to learn to do that. And we have a terrific problem here of the other, of judging the other of the color, of the habits, of the misunderstanding about mental illness. We all have to work on getting the, the feet into the right direction about changing our attitudes. And it's hard to change your attitudes, but it's essential if you're going to grow. You know, uh, I want to, uh, I want to uh, piggyback on what you just said, uh, Judy, because um, here I want to unite uh, Georgette's initial uh, work uh, in the creation of the Rabbi Mark Tannenbaum uh, Center. And uh, in your book, uh, Georgette, you list uh, some of the guiding, I'll, I'll use the word, it's probably not the right word, but principles that uh, you learned from watching uh, Rabbi Tannenbaum. And one of them, which just jumped off the page at me when I read it today, was uh, how to try to listen to someone you do not agree with <laughs> without viewing that person as your mortal enemy. Yes, right. And that that was for Rabbi Tannenbaum, uh, key to his work in interfaith relations. And that uh, this was something that you used in, uh, you know, or at least has been a part of how you focused on uh, the work you're currently doing with the Multi-Faith Alliance. By the way, Georgette, someone has asked a question in the chat about uh, if you could expand a little on the different faiths that are part of the Multi-Faith Alliance besides Judaism and Christianity. but. My point is for the both of you, because uh, Judy, you were just talking about this. It, certainly 
I can't comment on the cultures of Europe and continental Europe, but it's very discouraging to have hope that we can achieve this ambition that Rabbi Tannenbaum has, you know, set as a lodestar because it just seems like more and more in America, if I don't agree with you, you're my mortal enemy. And, uh, and I don't know how we can make progress that way. And I wondered if you could, either one of you or both of you want to comment on that point. Take an enemy to dinner? I don't know. <laughs> I was going to use some more, more succinct, <laughs> succinct language. But how can we? I think we do it in our day-to-day -day actions. Not the big actions that look like they're the headlines, but the smaller ones. The meeting on the street, the meeting in, in a church, in a gathering, uh, the ability to keep your, hold your tongue rather than condemning, um, of striking up a conversation with someone who's, who you wouldn't uh, normally uh, spend any time with, uh, find out what is their life like. Somebody said to me, you know, I, I lost a son to suicide many years ago. And uh, in, in, in talking to people about this issue, we want to break the taboo. And one of the things that we want to do is talk about it. Suicide is a terrible thing to happen, but it needs to be discussed so that it comes out of the area of taboo. And someone said to me, well, when you're feeling like that, why don't you try calling somebody and asking them what they're going through and how they're feeling, rather than having to expound, expand your own terror and horror of what's happened to you you then find out what their life is like. I think it, it's speaking out in wonderful, uh, articulate and marvelous ways from this book, Thou Shalt Not Stand Idly By. And I think it is part of the process of how we get to understand some other person. What are they thinking? What are they feeling? How, what happened to them today? Where is their center point? And where is their entry point? I think I think that what Judy has said is really profound, and I would just add to that um, something that's not so different from what Judy is saying, which is the importance of deep listening. Mm. And um, that uh, that's certainly something that was one of the great lessons um, from Mark, because mm -hmm. he did a lot of deep listening. He under he understood that. Behind, um, behind the anger, behind extremism is a lot of fear. Yeah. And one needs to understand the fear. You know, the great theologian, um, Christer Stendhal, who was the Bishop of the Church of Sweden in Stockholm and later became the Dean of the Harvard Divinity School. He said, how can you say you love me if you don't know what hurts me? Oh, yes. It's very important to understand what hurts yeah. the other. Yeah. And, and when things that hurt you are done, rather than attacking, it can be used as a teaching moment. And, mm -hmm. and Gary, I think the last program that I did at AJA was on confronting hate. Uh, it was when Mark's biography came out. That biography, the and I must say, this is a plug for AJA. The authors made such extensive use of the Tannenbaum archive here. Um, a couple of examples from that. Um, Jesse Jackson, when Jesse Jackson went on about Jaime Town and he was roundly attacked by the Jewish community. Um, Mark didn't attack him. Mark said, let's do a program together. Mm. Let's do a debate. And, and they did that. It was the people to people program at, um, at Queens College. And, and that ended up reaffirming the ties 
between African Americans and Jews mm -hmm. rather than furthering the division. Yeah. And I think with Elon Omar and the comments that she made, um, I don't think that Mark would have attacked her. I think he would have reached out and tried to make it a teaching moment mm -hmm. that can bring communities together instead of separating them further. Mm -hmm. I really think that that's such an important point. Uh, I do want to give a shout out to my colleague, uh, Rabbi Philip Bentley, who made a comment, and I want to read because he uh, related to what you said, Judy. He said uh, in his comment here, he said, what Judy Collins is describing is a method called compassionate listening. Uh -huh. And those interested in this alternative could visit their homepage at compassionatelistening.org and read the literature and watch mm -hmm. the videos. It is to take a side in a conflict is to become a party to the conflict. And mm -hmm. if you want to make peace, it is necessary to listen to all sides. Right. right. So I wanted to read that. Uh, let me ask one more question because we're one of the things, you know, uh, Dr. Marcus, the namesake and founder of the American Jewish Archives always said, and he, he used to say to his students, remember that uh, the mind can absorb only as much as the tushy can endure. So, uh, so uh, we, want to, we want to end uh, in, in a timely fashion, it's five after five, but I do have one last question for the both of you. And that is, uh, before we conclude, and that is, uh, you really stress in the book, uh, the point, Georgette, about interfaith work. Mm -hmm. And that you say, in a sense, that, uh, that interfaith work has helped you to break through the roadblocks that arose at every turn. And, and those of you who are on the webinar, you know, when you read the book, you'll see this is, she summarizes this in 15 minutes today, but it, it, the story is a complicated story and, and all of that. Very, very and, and, you, and, and then you say, uh, 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 Georgette, that this is counterintuitive because we tend to think about religion as being the seedbed of conflict especially in the Middle East. And uh, I wondered if the both of you could explain, I, I'd love to hear a little more about why it is that interfaith relationship, working together in an interfaith, we, I myself am very involved here in the city of Cincinnati in that. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, it, it, because it may take uh, people by surprise, especially in this era in which we live, in which it seems like, you know, we are siloing into our own, uh, you know, communities, whereas you're pointing out, uh, Georgette, that uh, the interfaith nature of this has been the key to its success. So, yes, let me just paint a picture for you. Um, an example. We did a packing event. This is going back a few years at the armory on Lexington Avenue in New York. It's a very large armory. And we needed a large space because we had 900 volunteers there to pack um, sanitary kits to send to Syrian war victims. And at each table, you saw this wonderful blend of religions. At one table, you would see uh, a woman in hijab, another one in a sari, and a man in a yarmulke. And you had all of them working together to pack up these kits. In the Multi-Faith Alliance, we have uh, various brands of, of, of Christian organizations, Jewish organizations, Syrian organizations. We have Hindu, Buddhist, and not as part of the, a formal part of the alliance, but having provided a lot of uh, flour for our bakery, for example, Mormons. 
And the importance of that is that when religions band together and raise their voices in common in the face of a terrible tragedy, they serve as the conscience of the world. Mm -hmm. But even without getting into God talk, and we don't engage in a lot of God talk, we really focus on, on practicalities. Um, you know, religious institutions have vast constituencies that can be mobilized. They have sophisticated communication networks. They have street creds. Religious leaders, uh, clergy, they have great emotional intelligence. And very often after the UN peacekeepers, for example, are gone, the ones who are still there are the religious people, the, the clergy, the institutions, the religious actors. So that's part of the importance of working across religious lines. I will say, and I agree with what you said, and I'm glad to hear the description of this happening. I want to say that I believe that there is, every time I walk out onto a stage, there is the chance to prove the old question, can music change the world? And my answer is yes. And from the very beginning, in the very early 60s, in all the marches, and all the protests, in all the places where people gather, when I come off the stage, I have a unified and spiritually correct group of people who, under any circumstance at that moment, will do the right thing. <laughs> well, Judy, I, I have to say that there actually is a sacredness to your music. There is a sense of the sacred and, and spirituality. And not only that, but, uh, you know, the great rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel used to talk about his involvement in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And he talked about praying with your feet. Yeah. And Judy, you have prayed with your feet. <laughs> Thank you. That's such a nice way, really a wonderful way to end. And uh, so, Lisa, I'm giving you uh, 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 a heads up. If you have uh, Judy's new album, you can put it oh. up now. Uh, I don't know. Uh, OK, we're Thank sharing you. the screen. Oh, so yeah. I wanted to, at least by way of thanking you, Judy, uh, to tell everybody that in addition to everything that I've already said about her, a multitude of accomplishments, she is still producing uh, uh, albums and this is her most recent album. And what I've been told about it uh, is that it contains only music that Judy herself has written. Is that correct, Judy? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> a first, I might add. <laughs> Because I know that you know, you know, you've made other writers famous, and uh, with your beautiful renditions of their music, and uh, and so everybody who wants to take a little bit of Judy home, you can go and get. Uh, I used to say you can go out and buy that album, but now you don't have to even go out. You can go onto the internet, and it'll come to your house. Yes, so, uh, thank you. Uh, so thank you. And Thank you, uh, you're so welcome. So friends, before we conclude this afternoon's webinar, let me take this opportunity to thank our guests, Dr. Georgette Bennett and Judy Collins. I want to extend a special thank you, of course, to all of you who have elected to participate in this afternoon's educational offering. We are truly grateful at the AJA that you've given us your time. The AJA will continue to sponsor special topical webinars periodically on interesting facets of the American Jewish experience. In fact, as you see in front of you, next month on Tuesday, September the 20th, at the same time at four o'clock in the afternoon, right before the High Holy Days, the AJA will feature a special discussion 
on a new book titled Abraham Lincoln and the Fight for Peace, written by CNN's John Avalon. Now, some of you in the audience know that John and I share an interest in Abraham Lincoln. I've published a book on Lincoln and the Jews. So we're going to be talking and dialoguing about Lincoln's vision of lasting peace and the Jewish Americans who participated in that larger saga. So mark your calendars. I know you'll want to join us. Finally, last but not least, my gratitude and our gratitude goes out to the amazing staff and administration of the American Jewish Archives. And in particular, behind the shield is Ms. Lisa Frankel, whose contributions to the AJA for the past two and a half decades defy enumeration. Please remember to visit the AJA's website where you will find a recording starting tomorrow of our webinar. And you can also find that on Hebrew Union College's special online learning portal where you will also find that same recording. So Judy Collins, it's been a privilege to make your acquaintance. And to Georgette, thank you, thank you, thank you. And God bless you both. To one and all, let me say shalom, goodbye, and we look forward to seeing you all in the not too distant future. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Georgette. Bless and you both. Thank you. Thank you, Judy, Gary, and Lisa. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.